I welcome again, and as we come together for our online service each week, I like to start uh, just a little bit about maybe where we are, what's going on in the world, what in the world is happening, and uh, I think probably everyone is well informed on the coronavirus and how quickly it's spreading, and our prayers that uh, it will decrease. And uh, there's also happening though a, a spiritual uh, aspect. And um, so, what in in the world is happening? Matthew 16, verses two through three say, "He replied, When evening comes, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red." And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And in reality, uh, when God set the world going uh, all the way back in, at the creation, there was a time that uh, it was going to end as well. And we're kind of on that map and where we are uh, we don't know exactly, and I don't really try to say a, a day, anything about a day or, or that because the Bible says not to. But Jesus did say that we should know the signs and the times. And just a couple things that are happening in this worldwide pand pandemic and crisis uh, that may have an impact or be a sign toward moving into the, uh, toward the, the real, really the end. One of the things that the Bible says in Revelation is that uh, authority is going to ultimately be placed in in one person's hands. Revelation 13, 7 says, He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them, and he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And when events like the coronavirus pandemic happen, a lot of people say, well, we have to have stronger, uh, more centralized power to be able to deal with something this big. And so when there are crises like this, uh, it tends to um, move us in the direction of more of a global government. And I've heard some things this week about, well, we, you know, with international trade, we have to be able to have an authority over all of that. And we have some organizations like the World Health Organization and that, and uh, sort of the UN, uh, but the Bible says that we're going to be moving even stronger in that direction. Another thing is that... Uh, uh, the Bible predicted also in Revelation that there would be a, a time, uh, well, Revelation chapter 13, verses uh, 16 and 17, he also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the na name of the beast or the number of his name. And obviously, I don't think anybody really has a good handle exactly what that is, but what we know is that the Bible predicts there's going to be a time when uh, it'll be impossible uh, for us to purchase things as we normally do. And that's something that we're moving in a direction of with uh, events like the coronavirus as well. I've heard some uh, people in authority who said, well, money is dirty. We can't be passing that. We need to move to more of a cashless society. And when that happens, then uh, we can be controlled more in terms of what we can buy or not. And I think it's an amazing thing that two, almost 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit revealed that to John, and now we live in a day and a time when we have the technology where we can really uh, see that coming. So I just pray that uh, everybody is safe. In fact, let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Lord, we ask that you would uh, protect us from this, Lord. We thank you that you are our hope. Uh, we have no hope in this world or anything of the world. It's all in you. And I just pray that we would walk according to your wisdom, Lord, and to, to your truth. And I pray that you would bless the time that we have here, that uh, you would bless every aspect of it, and that uh, we'd just be drawn closer to you, Lord. And even though we're obviously scattered all over uh, the, the area here, but you would give us a sense of being together as one body, as your church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Also because we are continuing on, because our uh, needs continue and we want to be able to help those uh, in need, we are collecting our offering. There's a couple ways to do that. You can go to our website, www.lifewaychurchvista.com, and there's a link you can click on to make contributions online, or uh, if you'd prefer, you can mail your, 
your donations to the church office here, Lifeway Baptist Church, 1120 Highland Drive, Vista, California, 92083. And uh, so I just thank you for uh, your contributions and for your, your generosity in this time. And we do want to be the church, and we pray that uh, um, God will, as he has promised, uh, meet all of our needs. Also, going forward, we have, um, uh, today is Palm Sunday, um, and uh, we have good two services coming up within the next week. The first is Good Friday. Uh, that'll be at 6 o'clock on the Watch Together. Again, I will send you all an, an email so you can line into that, and the message will be the empty to-do list. Uh, we're going to focus on the word to tell us die. Uh, it is finished, meaning paid in full. There was nothing else to do. That's why we have an empty to-do list, and we'll look more at the meaning of that word. We will also have uh, the Lord's Supper together. We'll be taking communion. So before 6 o'clock, get whatever you're going to have to partake in that, and we will uh, be united in the body and the blood of Jesus. Then a week from today is Resurrection Sunday. The message will be the ultimate rebuild. Uh, as it stands right now. I'm planning and hoping to do a drive-in service, uh, which I don't believe violates any um, of the rules in that that are happening now because we'll maintain social distance, uh, we'll be in our cars, uh, but we'll have a way to worship together. And I felt like that was important uh, for, uh, for an Easter Sunday uh, to at least be in the same parking lot. Uh, if things happen and, and regulations are changing very rapidly, it's a very liquid situation, then I'll just keep you posted uh, throughout the week on what's happening with that. Um, also, uh, it is Palm Sunday, and for the last uh, five years, we've had on Palm Sunday a, a Palm Sunday drama. Uh, and unfortunately, we weren't far enough along to, to pull that off this year. Um, so washing Judah's feet will have to be done uh, soon, uh, maybe next year on Palm Sunday. Um, but we're ready to go with that, obviously. But in lieu of that, at the conclusion of our service today, we'll have an encore showing of Emmaus, uh, which was last year's drama, and I think that, uh, that you will like that as well. So today we're going to look at uh, the Passion Week, and um, there's two ways to look at, at things. One is to have a micro approach, where you get, have like a microscope and you look at the, the, the every small aspect of it, but there's also a macro approach, and I wanted to look at today at the Passion Week wow kind of from um, a different, uh, a bigger view, and, and that is just all of the things that, that Jesus did. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, so Jesus is doing his ministry, and we know it's getting close to the end, it says, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So Jesus had great resolve. Resolutely is the word that we have uh, when we think about resolutions and that. So even though he was, wasn't all that close to Jerusalem at that point, he, was, he had great resolve that he knew where he was going and he knew why he was going there. So what was the busiest week of your life? In some ways, these times are kind of strange because a lot of us don't have a lot to do because we're at home, uh, away from school or work or that. Um, but yet, life seems really busy because of the intensity of everything um, that, that's happening. Well, Jesus had the most amazing week in the history of, uh, of the world, uh, the week that we call the Passion Week. Jesus' roadmap was leading to the cross, and he was resolutely heading in that direction. To show kind of how important and intense this time was, it's generally believed that Jesus lived about 33 years on this earth, including three years of public ministry. And we look at what we call the Passion Week, going from his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Sunday until the following Sunday when he was resurrected. If you look at the four Gospels in Matthew, seven of those 28 chapters in Matthew are focused on that one week. In Mark, it's five out of those 16 chapters, just one week. In Luke, five of the 24 chapters are on the Passion Week. And in John 9, that's 
fairly close to half of the entire gospel focuses and centers just on that one week. The word, uh, we call it the Passion Week, and, and in our language today, that makes us think of what we're really passionate and really invested and, and really strong, but really the word here for passion is from the, the Latin pasio, which means suffering, and that is what Jesus did that week, and uh, especially if you've seen the passion of the Christ movie, uh, you know and understand that. Our focus often is just on the big events. We think about Palm Sunday, the Lord's Supper, Jesus' arrest and his trials, the crucifixion, uh, and the resurrection. But it's important to see that there was a lot also that happened in that week. If you look at and read through that, and I like to read through the Bible. I try to do it most every year. I've probably read through the Bible about 20 times uh, in my life. And my favorite way to read through it is in a chronological Bible because that gives it in the order of the events that happened. And if you take this week of Jesus' life in a chronological way, you see all of the amazing teaching uh, and events that were happening. Uh, he taught about the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He taught about the widow's might and how this widow, who had seemed to give so little, had actually given more than the rest. He also discussed the Olive, what is known as the Olivet Discourse, which is Jesus' uh, strongest prophetic message at all when the disciples ask him uh, about the temple and what, what was going to be happening. And he laid out uh, an, an impressive story about all the things that would happen before he returned. He also taught about the vine and the branches and about how important it is for us as the branches to be connected to the vine. He also taught about the coming of the Holy Spirit which of course was critical because he said it's better for you that I go because if I don't if I don't go the Holy Spirit can't come and so it was giving hope in the time that it was being acknowledged he was teaching that he had to go how the Holy Spirit would come and would be our guide he also taught about the rejected stone that the stone that was rejected becoming the cornerstone he also talked about the way and the truth and the life and so we see in this time that he wasn't just involved in things in, that were happening. He was actually teaching about things that were really important, really deep things in his life. And that's also seen in the parables that he taught uh, in, this, uh, in, in this week of his life. He taught the parable of the two sons and how uh, one said he would go and do the father's will, but he didn't. And one who said he wouldn't, but he ended up doing it in that. And he also had the murderous tenants, the parable of the murderous tenants, which are the ones who were invited to the wedding feast, and yet they decided they weren't going to come, and they um, wanted to kill the, the, the sons of the, the, the father who was inviting everyone. Uh, we also have the parable of the, the wise and the foolish virgins, uh, which is critical in this time as well, because that also talks about being ready for the return of Jesus and how foolish it was for those uh, virgins who did not have their oil, enough oil, uh, so that they were asleep, when the, and they were asleep when the bridegroom came. And Jesus also taught the parable of the talents, which was about the, the servants who got talents while the master was away, and they were evaluated on how well they used those talents. So in the things that Jesus is teaching, we see just the strength and, the, um, and the, the intensity of the time that he was in and, um, and, and looking also forward to the end times as well. Jesus also had a lot of Q&A with the religious leaders uh, looking for a way to trap him. And they tried to, um, to get him to slip up so that they would have a reason uh, for him to be arrested and convicted of some crime. Uh, and uh, the, the most famous, perhaps, of these is in Matthew 22, 17 through 22, where it says, Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. 
When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. And we see Jesus really teaching, and what he's saying there is that um, we need to, in our lives, uh, regardless of what's going on, we need to be focused on giving God what belongs to him. Yes, we should give to Caesar what is Caesar's and follow the rules as, uh, unless they contradict with God's rules. But what's really important is that we give to Caesar. There is a difference in our life, whether we're giving to God or to something else or someone else. And our focus is to give God uh, what is due him with our lives. There were other encounters during this week a fig tree uh, that Jesus cursed. And most people believe that's symbolic of the nation of Israel, that it was supposed to be bearing fruit, uh, and it wasn't. Uh, Jewish coins of that time had fig trees on them, and so that's why people believe that. And you see how timely that is, as they are rejecting him as the Messiah. They should be bearing fruit, but they, wouldn't, they weren't. And so Jesus cursed that fig tree, and it died. You also see Jesus in another strong uh, event going in and cleansing the temple and saying to them that what was supposed to be sacred and holy they've just turned into a, a marketplace and a way for them to make money for the money changers too because people came from all over the world really for uh, the, the main feast of Israel uh, and so they had to exchange their money and they were shortchanged by those in the temple so that who were when they were selling to the, 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 the Jewish people so that they could make the proper sacrifices. And Jesus is saying it's not about money and making money. It's about the worship of God and how, how, um, how that was desecrating uh, the, the place of worship, the temple. Then Jesus also in this time encountered the, the guy that we know that as the rich young ruler. And he um, said that he, had, he was a good man who had never sinned. And yet he gave up um, the opportunity to follow Jesus because he wanted to hold on to his riches. And in this time, this week, where Jesus is clearly showing who he is, it, uh, the story of the rich young ruler shows what we need to give up for the opportunity to follow Jesus. And nothing is greater than that opportunity in our lives. Then we also see... <laughs> In this, uh, in this week, during this week, Jesus had an exciting venture, adventure in the judicial process in which he was tried by the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish religious authority, and the Romans. Uh, both of those trials were completely illegal in the way that they were ha handled. He was convicted and executed in less than 24 hours. Uh, that's an amazing thing, to realize that in less than 24 hours, he was tried, convicted, and executed. Uh, obviously, in our judicial system today, that would never happen. But everyone conspired against Jesus, all of the authorities, because he was such a threat to them. And he, all of that happened in less than 24 hours during the Passion Week. And amazingly enough, also in this, Jesus had an under-this-world experience, not an out-of-this-world experience experience, but an under this world experience. When Jesus was hanging on the cross in Luke 23, 43, Jesus answered them and said, I tell you the truth to one of the thieves on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise uh, in the Jewish mind was recognized as uh, Sheol, uh, which was a place that was in the center of the earth. And Jesus um, told this thief who had acknowledged Jesus and said, remember me, that that thief would in fact be with Jesus in paradise uh, that day. Uh, Matthew 12, 40 says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we see that Jesus had an under this world experience. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it says, Therefore God exalted him, being Jesus, to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So we see that even in this 
um, whole week that, would, that Jesus has happening. In addition to that, it's a whole spiritual battle on a different plane that we cannot even uh, understand in the time between the crucifixion and the resurrection. And in looking at this week, uh, we also need to uh, kind of try and clear something up or to explain something. Uh, from the verse, uh, an expanded of the verse that we just looked at in Matthew 12, says, Then some of the te Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And our traditional calendar for this week is that Jesus was crucified on Good Friday and he rose on, uh, on Sunday, Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. But if Jesus was crucified on Friday, there's not enough time as for there to be three days and three nights before the resurrection. And I a person who believes that Jesus said what he meant and meant what he said. So what is going on with that? And there are those who tried to explain it by saying, well, it was partial days and that, but no matter how you do it, you've only got two nights, uh, Friday night and Saturday night, in that circumstance. And so in looking at the Passion Week, it's important to see that um, we really look at, from a, at it from a Gentile perspective and not a Jewish perspective. I, a close inspection of the, the passages in here give us some insight into how it really was three days and three nights. Matthew 28, 1 says, uh, After the Sabbath, and I have in there parentheses plural, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. So this is Resurrection Sunday. And it says, after the Sabbath, but the word there uh, for Sabbath isn't singular. You can tell in the Greek that it's actually plural. So it's not talking about a single Sabbath, but two Sabbaths. And then John 19, 31 says, Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. And I underline that to see that, because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So Sabbath is the Sabbath is the seventh day, which we associate with Saturday, and so it's believed he was crucified on Friday. But we need to see in in this that if you look at this in the the Jewish calendar, and we know it was Passover time, and the Jews had a calendar of feasts and festivals, and this in the spring feasts there were three uh, important feasts or or holidays, and and the first was Passover which celebrated the, the lamb being slain so that the angel of death passed over the Israelites in Egypt on the first Passover night. Then there was a Feast of Unleavened Bread, which talks about getting the sin out of your life. And then there was also the Feast of the First Fruits, which uh, was being thankful for, for the harvest. So the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a special Sabbath, putting the crucifixion one day earlier and allowing for Jesus to be in the tomb for three days and three nights. So in a normal week, there's one Sabbath. On, um, in, in the Passover week, there were two Sabbaths because of the, the, the Sabbath of the unleavened bread. And uh, so by knowing and understanding how that all worked, it fits together for Jesus to be in the grave three days and three nights. And those three days and three nights, he was actually under the earth uh, talking to those who had already passed, uh, had died, and were waiting for him there. So in looking at this according to the Jew Jewish calendar, Jesus was right on time in every aspect. Uh, on Sunday, which was uh, the triumphal entry day, in, Jesus was preventing him, presenting himself for inspection. It was that Sunday that the Lamb was presented for inspection, uh, according to the Jewish calendar, the Passover lamb was being inspected. So Jesus came as the lamb of God to be inspected. Uh, he was crucified on the day the Passover lamb was slain. He rose on the day of the feast of first fruits. And as he was sinless, 
he fulfilled the feast of unleavened bread. So we see in the Jewish calendar of feasts, and especially in these spring feasts, but all seven feasts throughout uh, the year, that Jesus was the perfect fulfillment of them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 27 says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul didn't use the word first fruits arbitrarily. He was discussing that Jesus was literally the first fruits. Because when the Jewish, Jewish priests on the first resurrection Sunday, the first day of the week, were out waving their sheaves to celebrate that, Jesus had been raised from the dead, the first fruits of the resurrection. Uh, verse 21, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all would be, will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then, when he comes, those who be, uh, when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. So in this Passion Week, not only is Jesus living this out, not only is he teaching, not as only is he dealing with being betrayed in that, but he's also fulfilling beautifully uh, the feast and the prof prophetic nature of the Old Testament. And this is beautifully seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, which says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was all about getting the leaven out of your house to celebrate that, and leaven represented sin. He who had no sin became sin for us so that we could get the leaven and sin out of our lives. And that's how Jesus fulfilled uh, that feast in our lives as well. And the focus really of the, 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 the Passion Week is what Jesus did. And Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Jesus, Paul, when he wrote those words to the church at Corinth, said that it was of first importance, and he outlines what happened during the Passover week, at least part of it, when he said that uh, he died for our sins, he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And what a beautiful verse that is, because it goes on to say, after that, that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and then to five hundred of the brothers at the same time. And the story of the, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is one that was passed on from that week in history all the way to the present time. And it's important to me to see that what Paul says is that it, it wasn't just written down or silently, it wasn't a mystery uh, book, but it was something that was spread and that there were 500 people still at the time of Paul's writing this letter to the church at Corinth who had witnessed that. And so if the story was not true, they could have just gone and, um, and, and acknowledged that there were no witnesses, but there were 500 at that time. And from that 500, it goes to 
the statistics that I've read say there are a billion believers in Jesus walking the earth today, and hopefully we are still uh, telling and sharing the story of that first Passion Week. And then Paul says, uh, last, last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And I just want to focus for a second on the importance of Paul becoming a Christian, because although I don't believe that the disciples would have died for the lie, for a lie, knowing that Jesus had not been resurrected, but saying that he was, it's slightly possible that they would say, well, this has been a good ride, let's play this out and see how far we can go. But nobody can understand how Paul, who was dead set against the gospel, became a believer in Jesus the Messiah and the Savior, and even went to his death proclaiming a risen Jesus. The only explanation is that Paul encountered that same Jesus on the road to Damascus. And that's how he became a believer. So in all of this, we're seeing all of the amazing things in a seven-day period that Jesus did and had happened to him and fulfilled. And there's one other strange uh, thing about this. Jesus had a, a strange burial for a condemned criminal. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9 says, He was assigned a grave with the wicked. And that is true. If you are crucified, the general policy at that time, after you're taken down from the cross, you're basically dumped on the city dump. You're put in the rubbish heap. And in that circumstance, overnight, all the dogs and other creatures uh, uh, come and basically eat you up. And you are no more. And yet, Isaiah goes on to write, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no, done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He was assigned a grave with the, 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 wicked, the wicked, and yet his burial place was with the rich, because Joseph of Arimathea entered, who was a wealthy man, who had a tomb that he wanted Jesus to be buried in, and he went to Pilate and got permission to do that. And the thing that's important, it just shows you how beautifully all of these details work together. If, like other crucified criminals, Jesus had been thrown in the garbage dump uh, and was eaten by the, his body eaten by the dogs and the other animals of um, vulture-type animals, then there would be no way of proving the resurrection because you would not expect there to be a body. But the way that God worked it out, there was a tomb that they could go to where there should have been uh, a body and there was not. No grave, no burial, no resurrection. And yet, God worked on Joseph of Arimathea's heart to complete uh, the story and to complete and to show the physical resurrection of Jesus. In Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, and this is not a passage from the Passion Week, but it's one that's important to everyone. It says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. What about you? What will you give in exchange for your soul? The, the statistics say that the, the vast majority of this world will get through the coronavirus and go on living our lives. But the even more important question is, what about the afterlife? What will you give in exchange for your soul? Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before the Father. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before the Father. And uh, I've shared a number of times an experience I had when I was uh, in high school. My parents, we lived in the San Francisco area. We went into San Francisco for dinner uh, at Girardelli Square. And as usual, there weren't any parking places close, so we dropped off my mom and my sister. My dad and I went and parked the car, 
And I, as we were going to meet them, I was dawdling along looking at cars that I wanted to buy when I got my license and things like that. And I got separated from my dad. And while I was walking by myself, uh, a big black Lincoln Continental with two undercover policemen pulled up and stopped me and prevented me from going anywhere. After discussion, I came to realize that, that I bore an uncanny resemblance to a runaway from Salt Lake City who they believed was in San Francisco. And there was nothing that I could do personally to make this police officer realize that I was who I said I was. And as we're going through this whole discussion, my dad realized that I should be with him and I wasn't. So he came back to see what was happening. And three times this officer asked my dad, are you sure this is your son? And every time my dad said, yes, this is my son. And what a, a relief it was for me to be acknowledged by my father as his son. But how much more important will it be on that day when I stand before him and Jesus acknowledges me before the Father. Every one of us will have a day like that. The Bible is clear. It is appointed each man wants to die, whether you die of coronavirus or an accident, whether you die of old age or whatever it is, it is appointed each one wants to die. And then the judgment. Our only hope is that Jesus will acknowledge us before the Father. If you've never acknowledged Jesus as your Savior, there's no better day or time right now as we've looked at this week in the life of Jesus and all that he did, all he experienced, all he accomplished. He did it all for us. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we could become the righteousness of God. So I'm going to have a time of prayer and I'm going to ask that you uh, especially if you've never accepted him as Savior, that you would join with me in the first part of the prayer. And then also as we pray to conclude this service. Heavenly Father, what a joy to see all that you did for us. We've had some busy, what we believe are busy weeks in our life, but nothing like this week when you did all of that and you did it for us and you suffered. You suffered in a way that we can't even understand or comprehend. You suffered physically. Crucifixion is probably the, the most torturous way of execution ever created. You suffered spiritually when you hung on the cross and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You suffered, Lord, and you did it for us, but you had the victory when you rose from the dead. And we can have that victory as well. And Lord, to be acknowledged by you, we acknowledge our own sin. Lord, your word says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That describes each and every one of us. But we thank you that you made the way for us when through all that you did in that one week so that we could go to heaven. You paid the price for us and we accept your gift of salvation. And Lord, like the disciples who experienced that, we want to be disciples who tell others as well. So we acknowledge our sin. We accept your free gift of life. And we commit to confess the truth of the gospel wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a good week.